So I'm the debunk guy. I'm your first debunk character. Therefore, to debunk means to ask different questions. It means to challenge. It means to think differently. And then hopefully to act differently. So that would be my goal today, is to challenge some of the assumptions around what a brand actually is. So if you received a phone call from me at your office, and I said, hi, I want to talk to you about your brand, be honest. The things that you would think I'm calling you about are what? Just call them out. Oh, who put you in? <laughs> Advertising, yep. Sorry, the what? Yeah, experience the website, my messages, my logo. Well, none of those are wrong, but my new partner, um, who's <laughs> joining me at level five next week, is what I want to talk to you about, because it's not enough, and especially in light of what Kevin and Matt have just share, shared with us in terms of the role that change is playing in our environment, not just our economy, but our environment the way people act and interact. Brands are business systems, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. We say to most companies when we start a discussion with them that your brand is today probably the most misunderstood and underleveraged asset sitting on your balance sheet. And they usually snap back and say, my CFO is not in the room. Well, that's okay. But we're here to talk to you about a much greater level of value creation. And though I talk about balance sheets, etc., everything that I'm saying here today applies as much in the not-for-profit sector as it does in the profit and the commercial sector. And we've had a lot of experience to prove that. So what I want to show you is some challenging thoughts that might ask you to think differently about your brand by the end of it. So, five notions that destroy profit. You say, well, we're a not-for-profit. Well, are you? You're just as much about profit. I think what Kevin just told us is a perspective. We're much as much about profit as we are relationships. So, it's things that destroy brands, relationships, experience. So, the five truths that basically destroy these. Brands add value simply by raising awareness. I've got a great brand because everyone knows about it. My brand awareness actually leads to more profit. The more people are aware, the more things I can do. The key to branding is basically Marcom, marketing communications. Because managing communications and managing brand are kind of the same. I'm here to talk to you about my messages, my logo, my advertising, whatever. And that the best way to grow brands is basically raise the marketing budget. Well, actually, you can build a great brand and lower your marketing budget. So when I talk to you about a brand as a business system, it's within the context of this great Michael Porter quote, competitive strategy is about being different, right? Delivering a unique mix of value and doing it in a way that nobody else is doing it. But choosing to perform activities differently than our rival. Activities. You notice he doesn't say marketing. A whole range of activities. Because most organizations, as we have found, when I talk brand to them, they still basically think about what I'm going to use as an analogy is all the things above the waterline of an iceberg. The things you touch, see, interact with, can talk to. Its name, its logo, its media, its packaging, merchandising. And in today's world, as Matt just showed us, those range of activities has just simply gone ballistic. There are so many more choices within cause, customer relationships, the way we use e-channels and environmental messaging. So there are so many ways that I can actually communicate my promise to the market. But in fact, through the 250 plus companies, organizations that we've worked with, and over 25 not-for-profits within that, what we have found is that where most brands falter is below the waterline the way they're structured, the way their processes are set up, the way they communicate, the type of information that they extract from themselves and from the market, and even the way they make decisions. The culture of the organization can have as much 
a positive or a negative influence on the success of the brand. And 85% of our clients run into their single largest major brand challenge, not in the advertising, not in the media plan, not even in the product. Usually, it's the way they deliver it. Because as we say, a brand is the value of a promise that's consistently kept. If I didn't show up for this discussion today, your value in David Kincaid's personal brand would probably go down. I didn't keep my promise to you. But as promises have to become more complex and have to be delivered through a greater range of channels, it's a tougher job within the organization to keep all those promises. It's a tougher job even just to stay on top of those promises and to measure them and make sure that we're actually delivering on what we say. Because building and maintaining a successful brand is simply find an unmet need, deliver it to the market in a quality way, in a consistent way, make people aware of it, make it ready available, and then watch everything pour in. Huh. That's the way it was for Paul and I in the late 70s when we started in packaged goods. That's all you had to do. It was so simple. Well, today, it's harder than you think. Simply finding an unmet need is a difficult task, largely because we have done proprietary research and have developed a tool that has actually gone in and mapped need states. And guess what? The age-old attitudes shape behavior, and yes, emotions shape attitude. What we've actually found is the problem is we've been playing with a small, small inventory of emotional need states. Why? Because human beings can't articulate emotion. This has now been tested. Over 5,000 brands with over 300,000 consumers. B2B, B2C, profit, not-for-profit, all around the world. Men on average, come on ladies, can articulate 10 emotions. And yes, they're probably the ones you're thinking. <laughs> Women, can articulate 14. We don't run away with the show. Call it a draw at 12. <laughs> There's all human beings, male and female. 12 emotions. Well, with the individual that we worked with out of South Africa who ran the Unilever Institute of Product Development, he said, that can't be. I know there are more emotional need states out there. So he actually, from a neurological standpoint, went out, because that's what emotions are. They're neurological impulses. He actually went out to identify and map the correlation and interaction amongst all your emotions. Guess what he found? How many you've got? 96. And guess what? A third of them are negative. When was the last time he did some marketing research and tracked your negative attributes? So uncovering not just the what we need to offer and the how we need to offer it in the market, but the most important question of all, especially in the not-for-profit space, is to answer why. Why does somebody need us? What can we deliver that nobody else can deliver? And what we found, at minimum, regardless of sector, regardless of what part of the world you're in, at minimum, 50% of every decision that a consumer or a donor makes is driven by emotional attributes. Minimum is 50. To put that within context of your own brand, many of you, I'm sure that number would be even higher. So getting to the heart of that unmet promise is very difficult. It's actually even harder than you think to deliver that now, assuming that they could articulate it. Because companies actually don't set themselves up, structure their processes, their organization, their roles, their responsibilities, how they compensate people, how they motivate, how they attract and retain people, based on that promise. This is a model that was developed by a gentleman by the name of Michael Tracy out of the, out of the Harvard Business School. The most wonderful, simple way of thinking about how to structure your organization. Are we world-class at product leadership? Are we world-class at operational excellence? Are we world-class at customer intimacy? And guess what? I can give you, if you're interested during the break, a profile of hundreds of brands that are world-class at any one of the three. 
So one of them's not better than the other. But what it is, as Michael Porter said, is a strategic choice of how we want to structure our company based on the promise we want to make in the market. And when I say structure, I'm not just talking about boxes and reporting lines. I'm talking about everything from those processes, systems, people, competency profiles, and importantly, and I think Marty Parker is going to talk to you about this later, increasingly important, or I think it's always been important, but we're just now are realizing how important it is, is the culture that your brand creates within the organization. So, finding a promise, but then being able to set yourself up to deliver it is quite a challenge. Why? Well, because if you're not interested in those four things, growth, profit, sustainability, or managing risk, I'd say don't invest in building a brand. Go ahead, have a transaction, make it a good price, somebody will buy it. Right? Your friends and family will probably buy it even if it's not a good price. But growth, getting into new markets faster, being able to partner with people, extending your brand into new products and services. Great example, Lululemon. They've taken the whole space of looking better to actually being better and feeling better. Direct energy, a bad case study. They used to rent you your water heater. Suddenly they were able to do everything from that and shingle your roof and put in your windows. And, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't believe you. I don't think you can keep that promise. Enhancing cash flow, being able to charge a price premium. Harley Davidson, great example. Cadillac, not a good example. Did you know that today a totally topped up Harley Davidson Roadster sells for more than a baseline Cadillac. Why? Strength of the brand. Managing risk. Everything from your brand's reputation in the market, but to churn rates, employees. It costs you $300,000 to replace and find a mid-level manager in Canada today when you put all the costs in. That's stats and data. 300,000. You're losing 10% of your employees a year because they're not part of something bigger. That's a big cost. Michael McCain did a wonderful job. He actually went from killing people to having the company's best quarter in history two years later. Why? Because we let them. Because of the quality of the brand. The friends at DP, I think that's a case study in and of itself. Sustainability. Four Seasons, BMO, two different brands, different models, different ability to make a promise and then keep it in the market. So what is your promise? And then the challenge I'm placing to you is, are you set up to keep it? Because it affects your customers. It affects your suppliers and your partners all around the world. It affects your employees. It affects your shareholders, people that, you know, your donor base, your board. It affects other stakeholders, the media, public opinion leaders. And it does it in a way that drives value. A strong brand can drive a seven times value. It's not just on the balance sheet, but I can actually bring in seven times the number of donations from a strong brand than a weak brand in the not-for-profit sector. We've got the data to prove that. Because it does start as Kevin was saying, is the perspective. Mindset matters. If all we're doing is managing the Marcom, you will not release the value that I just talked about. Because your perspective is that your brand is marketing. Brand is strategy. It is change. It's the community and the way we engage with it, internally and externally. It's our culture. It's the way we structure ourselves in the market. All of that speaks to the asset called our brand. And importantly, those used to at one point be almost a linear equation. We'll figure the strategy out, and sooner or later we'll figure out what the strategy is. No. In today's world, as we just saw, all of this is happening constantly. Because it does drive what we call brand health and brand wealth. Every single one of you is a brand owner. Every single one of you has brand health measures and brand wealth measures. Do you know what they are? Are you tracking them? Are they strategic choices? Are they the right ones? Because it could be from an internal health, anything from employee morale and turnover to external wealth. The actual margin that I can make, the amount, the number of donations, 
the new acquisitions that I can make in a market. So looking at it and measuring it is a critical thing if you're going to release the value of your brand. Still not convinced? Describe this product for me. What is it? A clicker. What else? What does it do for you? Hmm. What would you pay for it? 20 bucks? 20 bucks, yeah. A clicker that I'd pay 20 bucks for. Now, what if I, all I did was take this exact same thing and put that logo on it? What's just happened to you? What is it now? A toy. Oh, the clicker, is that going to go? Now it's a toy, right? Would you pay more for it? It wouldn't. What's the brand stand for? Mothers. Quality, safety, dependability, reliability. You wouldn't pay more for that? I don't believe you. Fisher Price need to spend more in order to gain that reputation? Sure it did. It invested in all of what it came to stand for, right? And give it an advantage in its battle for share. Because your brand, and I'm not going to do 101 finance here, but there's the simple way we all do business, profit or not for profit. And in order to charge that price, we need a sustainable point of difference. We need ways to keep our costs down that our brand can actually point to. We need insight to get us into new markets and grow our share within those markets. So to do that, you do need some form of product superiority. We do need efficiencies that the brand can point to operationally. We do need a level of relationship, engagement, relevance, and bond with those consumers if we expect them to donate or to volunteer. We need a little bit of vision, a little bit of what Kevin was talking about. Who said that that had to be a $20 clicker? Great brands make all simple, ownable promises. When I say Volvo, and I'm giving the answer because for time reasons, but we've got this down pat. We've asked millions of consumers, they say safety. When we say Mercedes-Benz, they say engineering, and when they say BMW, people say performance. They're able to actually take the essence of everything I've just talked about into one word. And if you look internally at their structure, you would see that Mercedes-Benz truly is all about engineering. You would see that Volvo has invested, over-invested in becoming the leader in innovating safety within the automobile industry. Don't believe me? Go to their website. Somebody said earlier, tell the story. Look at their story. They do it beautifully. So, I'm going to give you a mini case study in the last two minutes that I've got here with you to show that it works not just in the automobile sector, it works in your world. Rosemary McCarney came to us as the head of Foster Parents Plan. And we asked her the question, what business are you in? What do you stand for? We asked her leadership team that, and that was the answer we got. Not quite sure. So they said, here's your starting point. What we are about is basically what we do. We promote, we lead child sponsorship all around the world. After going through the process of asking themselves diligently those questions about what that unmet need is that they truly have the ability to deliver on, what are our competencies within the organization that might be going under leverage that we could use differently, Suddenly, the whole world started to change for them. And it needed to, because when we looked at the space that they were playing in, we called it a sea of sameness. And that's sad. There's the home page or the advertisements for a whole range of, of programs with similar mandates that were operating against parents, donors, volunteers. Going through this process, what we basically came out with, you know what, I don't need a Band-Aid. A donation is a Band-Aid. When we did that diagnostic, what we found, people rationally were concerned. They didn't know where their money was going. Show me tangible proof that I'm having and making an impact. So I don't need a Band-Aid. I need a plan. 
And suddenly the whole look of the brand changed. We weren't about child sponsorship. We we're actually about sustainable futures. You can do anything. It was told through a very simple story. We took the word plan. We used it. We developed the Band-Aid as an icon. We put it in the child's first person, their language, not ours, not the organization's. And we invited people to be part of something very extraordinary. The look and the feel of all of the communication and the way we engage with people intern internally in the organization and with donors and volunteers changed. Suddenly we were about more than just child sponsorship. And we had the right to be because we could make a promise that we could, were set up to keep. That then gave them permission to go to, into a whole new space. And I don't need to talk about this because I think everybody with the wonderful week we've just gone through has seen the power. And Plan Globally would tell you this Canadian initiative was a founding impetus to that global program. The Because I'm a Girl program has been monumental, not just in terms of who it's reached, what, how it's messaged, the kind of donations and funding it's been able to attract, but it's given an organization belief that their promise could change, that they could change, they could do more, as Kevin was saying. So, in summary, please don't think of your brand as your marketing communication. It's a much bigger thing. It exists inside your organization as well as in the market. They, they're there to create growth. They are an under-leveraged asset. Use the asset. Change the perspective. And think about managing them differently. The accountabilities lie along clear health and wealth measures. Figure out which ones are yours and track them and measure them and hold yourself accountable to them. And importantly, the accountability for all of this starts at the top. Your marketing manager is not going to do this for you. It starts with you, with the people who debunk what a brand's really all about. I'll finish with Jack Welch's wonderful line. There is a very fine line between vision and hallucination. I'd love to see everybody in this room walk out with vision and a game plan on how to achieve it, not hallucination. Thank you very much.